What instances happened during the Revolutionary War of disarmament, of, of the monarch trying to disarm the people? Well, this is what's interesting, of course. Uh, in contemporary rhetoric, you hear a lot about, uh, and there's no question the English uh, tried to interdict gunpowder. Uh, of course, they're marching on the magazine in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, uh, Virginia erupts when, when Royal Marines sneak into the magazine there and steal gunpowder. Uh, and and uh, Lord Dunmore, in response to the Virginia militia's mustering, says, you know, he'll raise Williamsburg to ashes and free the slaves, which in fact causes even more people to become enraged, that efforts of the uh, British government to disarm Americans uh, are, are very well, uh, very much on people's minds uh, after the American Revolution. What's, what we forget today is that, of course, the American revolutionaries disarmed lots of people too. The American revolutionaries disarmed loyalists uh, in New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, they disarmed rebels in places like Shays' Rebellion mm -hmm. a little after the American Revolution. So uh, I think it's a general rule that governments, uh, whatever government is in power, usually is pretty comfortable disarming people they believe are threatening. And the American revolutionaries are no different. Uh, we have erased that side of it where we disarm the loyalists. We also tend to forget that we confiscated a lot of property from loyalists. Uh, it's hard to imagine an American government, although I suppose uh, uh, after Kilo versus uh, New London, maybe not so hard to imagine for some people. But the idea that American government's in the business of taking away property and redistributing it, mm -hmm. we usually associate that with different revolutionary traditions. But there was a little bit of that in our own. So I think the American Revolution is a lot more complex than most people realize. There are conservative strains of the revolution, quite radical strains of the revolution, and then what I would call the sort of central tendency of the revolution, which is uh, uh, built around these core Whig values. And, and it does generally uh, recognize private property subject to regulation. It recognizes a right uh, to keep and bear arms subject to regulation. It, rec it recognizes uh, a right to uh, speak and to publish and freedom of the press. They're not so much subject to regulation, but at least in the founding generation, subject to punishment if you step over the line. I think our modern notion of freedom of the press, which is very robust, uh, be surprising how how narrow the founders' conception was. They still, many of them believed in the idea that you could libel government. They believed in seditious libel. And people got punished. Newspaper editors got published uh, during the alien sedition crisis uh, in 1798. So, so the, the traditions that we have evolved and we live under are rooted in the ideas these people articulated. But everything that we've come to hold dear is not always really attributable to the founders. And I think they would have been OK with that because Madison, uh, one of the greatest of the founders, at least in terms of constitutional thought, not a very good president really, but um, some people are just not meant for that office. Uh, so Madison clearly believed, uh, he uses this great metaphor of a lighthouse, that history is like a lighthouse that shines this beacon and it's best at showing us where not to go and much less at where we should go. Because I think the founders knew what the dangers of the past were, but they were, try they were trying things that had not been tested before. This idea of a republic this size had not been tried. So there were certain leaps of faith and educated guesses they, they made in forming their uh, political and constitutional systems. So uh, they were very, very well attuned to the lessons of history, but they realized you can't move forward if all you do is emulate the past.